Hey there! Welcome to my Subnautica book nook build featuring a teeny prawn suit. Today we'll dive into a sea of mysteries like which biome did I pick again? How many glowing paints can I fit in this thing? And what the heck are these and why are there so many? Like all my nooks, we're starting with a paper template and a cardboard shell. I'm down to my last box, so it's probably time to order some snacks. In order to make sure the walls are sufficiently craggy, I'm making terrain in tinfoil and covering it in a layer of clay. I'm trying to use up my huge box of Sculpey Original, and I'm doing pretty well. It's nice for large things that don't need to be too detailed, because it comes in huge batches and is relatively cheap, but for me, it's so sticky. I think maybe because my hands get warm while crafting, the clay just turns into a kind of sticky ooze. On one hand, that's great because I can blend parts together really easily. On the other hand, I have to let it sit and cool down before I can put any kind of texture or details in it. Rock. I'm marking out where I want the twisty bridge connections to be. I really like the twisty bridges in Subnautica Below Zero, and I thought it would be cool to do a prawn suit in the deep twisty bridges. Which you should absolutely not do. It's a pain to get the suit out. I grabbed a bunch of screenshots for flora and rock references, and got to work making some bridges. Using my favorite bronze wire, I made some springs so I could figure out the general placement and shapes. The spring shape also helps the tinfoil not slide around on the bridge, and then the tinfoil helps the clay not slide around. Everything is so supportive. Don't worry if they look like those weird worm toys right now. When it's time to assemble, I'll blend them in nicely and they'll look like they belong. After doing the first one in Sculpey Original, I switched to Super Sculpey Firm. Yes, it's slightly harder to get a good smooth coating since the original is softer and easier to blend, but it pays off when you get to the detailing. It holds the details so much better and the tools don't just drag the clay around. The databank says they're rapidly growing coral polyps that exhibit thigmotropism, which causes growth in response to stimuli or when touching a solid object. So, my headcanon is that half the cracks are because of growing pains, and all the twists are because it keeps hitting fish as it grows. Every time it hits a fish, it changes direction, making them twist around. I'm just imagining the corals growing super fast and punting fish around on its journey to another wall. I was doing some test fits and I realized that the bridge way in the back was too thick for my liking, so I ended up redoing it. I'm still trying to figure out how to fake scale so that my nooks look deeper than they are, so this was a great piece to try out playing with wall angles and the size of things. The bridges also have these awesome barnacles on them, but since it's going to be pretty small, we're just going to fake the barnacles instead of individually creating tiny conical things, adding details, and poking holes in the top. I added more clay to the bottom sides of the bridges to be our general barnacly area. If you're tryptophobic, I suggest looking away for a while. I'm poking various sized holes in the fresh clay with some of my ball tools that we can pack with glow-in-the-dark paint later. The barnacle bridges are baking, so it's time to get started on some of the other inhabitants of the biome. I had taken some screenshots of the area with the crescent moon coral, so I started on those. I had decided on the deep twisty bridges, since one, twisty things are super cool, and two, the deep version of anything makes it way cooler. If you've played the game and know your biomes well, you might already spot the problem. But let's keep going! 
I rolled out a thin sheet of clay and used my circle cutters to cut crescent shapes. I know ordering from Timu is kind of a game of roulette when it comes to quality, but I ordered these anyway since I thought there wasn't a lot of room for error in the manufacturing. And they are totally worth it. I've used them on every project since I got them. When I had all my moons, I very carefully and deliberately placed each moon in an optimal location. Once my moons told me where they wanted to be and I made just a few tweaks, I started building in the vines. The trickiest part of this was definitely the little moon scaffolds. I cut them out of my thinnest wire and painstakingly arranged them in clumps that could be attached to the vines and the moons. While I was working, I realized I didn't quite have all the screenshots and angles I needed, so I popped into the game, hopped into my Seamoth, not the prawn suit, I really don't want it to get stuck, and headed for the deep twisty bridges. Well. This time, I had the info up and realized, no, this is not the deep twisty bridges. This is the regular twisty bridges. Oh no. Well, I found my way down there, and here's where the dilemma begins. I really wanted to do the deep twisty bridges. The lighting is awesome, there's so much more glow, and it's way creepier. But. I had just spent hours cutting tiny bits of wire so that the crescent moon coral will look nice, and they do not exist at that depth. Hmm. After much deliberation and a few emotional support snacks, I decided to rip out all the crescent moons and go with my original biome choice, the deep twisty bridges. I think this proves that when I pick a project, I am absolutely obligated to play through the game again for research purposes and not rely on memory and a few screenshots. The good news is that the deep twisty bridges have these weird veins on the walls, so we can repurpose some of the crescent moon coral for that. Now that I have the right biome, we can start on the flora again. Namely this one flora, the broken mandrake. The name is one of the great mysteries of 4546B. Why is it broken? Has it suffered heartbreak? Who broke it? We may never know. I'm making a few of them to hang out on the coral bridges. They're going to look so cool when they're all painted and glowing. Okay, back to the bridges. It's finally time to blend them into the walls. In order to make it look nice, I'm going to take this screenshot as inspiration and use the blue barnacles to blend the bridges. I will have to take them out, however, since I can't bake the entire nook at the same time. I'll put them all together later. But wait, didn't you say this was featuring a prawn suit? I don't see a prawn suit. Never fear, the moment is here. I built a little armature very early on in the project so I'd have a general reference and then set it aside. I've been really excited to try and make a window in resin. Honestly, I don't think it's going to be as clear as if I used a vacuum mold, but since I don't have a vacuum mold and I do have UV resin, resin it is. created a mold with my silicone putty and poured a tiny bit of resin into it. My idea was to spread it very thinly around the inside of the mold and blast it with the UV light to create kind of a shell to act as the window. I did a few thin coats to build up the thickness and demolded it. 
Sadly, the part that was touching the mold is still wet, even after curing it under UV for a long time. Also, a weird bubble formed out of nowhere during curing. I was so careful to get rid of bubbles, but this one just popped into existence instead of just popping. I was also able to cure the front of the window after demolding, so that turned out not to be such a problem after all. That bubble though, it kept haunting me, so I made another window. And another. And then realized that window was too short, so I made a new mold and new windows. And now I have an assortment of windows. Some are more clear than others, and others are more smooth, so there's less distortion. I'll have to make my decisions later. While I debated on the merits of each window, I created a tiny pilot seat. It may be hard to see in the final project, but I'll know it's there, and you'll know it's there, and that's what matters. In order to seat the window, we need some kind of edge. I built up a lip with a roll of clay, and it turned into a bathtub doing the backstroke. Well, interesting. I put the tiny seat into the bathtub and gave it a quick bake. It's a little early in the project for paints, but it is paint time. I can break out my stash of glowing paints and powders already. After a quick paint job, it's time to put on the window and build it into the body. Also, the window drama is not finished. I realized that even though the window was now taller, it didn't have the right profile. So more molds, more resin, more better. I knew I'd need to do this part but it's nerve-wracking. Every time I've painted something and then baked it in the oven, the paint has either gotten darker or it's bubbled. A few of you kindly gave me some suggestions of paints that might not do that, so wish me luck! It came out okay. Nothing bubbled, and the white is still white, and the blue is still blue. But the glow doesn't show through the window. I've been trying to think about why, and my best theory right now is that the light is getting too diffused going through the window and coming back out. But once again, I know it glows, and you know it glows, so that's good enough. Continuing on with the sculpting, I'm using one of the techniques that I did with my Horizon machines, where I add a bunch of clay and then cut out the shape of the armor. now he's evolved from a deep sea bathtub to a rotisserie chicken. Delicious! Since he'd never be able to stand up on these drumsticks, it's time to give him some real legs for ocean floor exploration. I really love the Subnautica games. It was my first intro into the crafting survival genre, and it absolutely hooked me. The flora and fauna are so inventive, and I'm a sucker for anything with a database. In every game, I'm always the person reading all of the flavor text and finding all of the books and the lore in-game, so having a scanner was so exciting for me. 
It's always fun to appreciate all the extra thought that goes into this world building. With his thighs done, it's time for the calves. I cut the calves and feet out of a single piece to make sure it was a little more structurally stable and level. I've found that when I make the feet and ankles separate from the calves, I always end up in a weird place where things are either not quite level or the ankle becomes a weak point, even when there's an armature. Now that he can stand with his own little froggy toes, it's time to make sure he can grab things. The basic grabby hand is pretty straightforward. We're starting with a slightly flattened log and rounding off one end. Just a couple of details, not sure what they really are. They look like vents of some sort? Do the arms need vents? Now for the fun part. The fingers. Again, a pretty basic shape. It's just really fiddly because it's so tiny. They're basically like little flat sausages with joints. Time for the grappling arm. That was the obvious choice for the other arm, since it's probably the only way he'd get out of the deep twisty bridges. The grappling arm is about the same size, but it's more of a log instead of a flattened log. Even easier! This arm has much more solid elbow joint, so out come the circle cutters again to make a big elbow hinge. One more time with the circle cutters to make the flying saucer part where the cable is coiled. And time for the grapple bit! I'm not putting it on the arm, because I'd really like him to be mid-grapple in the nook. At some point, I made his jets and I stuck them on his back, so now it's time to build them into the head and the shoulders part. I made the hatch separately and baked it so I could easily embed it, but as I was playing around with placement, something just seemed off. I went back to the pictures, and... It's the window! 
the window is still not tall enough. And it's already baked into place. So now what? I figured out a not so elegant way around it though. I grabbed some clay and I built up his forehead into a five head and made another mold of that area. I'm going to attach this new window shell to the old window shell and then build around that. Yes, we'll still see the seam line, but I'm really hoping it won't be noticeable in the nook. But I'll know, and you'll know, and I guess neither of us will be able to unsee it. Now that that's settled, time to build up his shoulders. It's working so much better now, but doesn't he kind of look like a crab from the top? The evolution continues. Everybody needs pockets, so let's get the storage module and plug in his power cells. Which makes him look like a crab who put his eyeballs on wrong. Time to slide his grabby hand on, and the bathtub rotisserie crab is complete. He's everything but a prawn. His insides are painted, so now it's time for the outsides. First, few coats of white to give him the freshly fabricated look. The standard prawn suit color scheme is pretty straightforward, but there were some conflicting grays in the screenshots and art that I found. In the end, I decided on the lighter of the grays, since it looks a little better with the lighting I have in mind. Can't forget all the tiny orange details, too. He needs a little pop of color. And of course, the lights. I considered embedding LEDs, but in the end I opted against it. I have a habit of continually adding to the scope of projects as they go, so next time I'll try to plan ahead for the time to do LEDs if I think they'd be cool. I've been surprisingly uncreative when it comes to naming and changing the color schemes of my vehicles in Subnautica, so he's just going to be the generic prawn suit. He isn't the only thing that needs to be painted, so let's get started on the terrain. Before you say, wait, rocks aren't blue, this is a special exception. I really want to lean into the deep feeling, so I took a bunch of screenshots and a bunch of liberties. I made sure my reference were when my Seamoth's lights were out, 
and the overall feeling was of this rich purple-blue area dotted with bioluminescent flora and squidge arcs, but this is a peaceful book nook, so we're going to pretend they don't exist. So many layers of different blues. This seems to be a theme with my Subnautica projects. Last time it was the eye stalks that had so many layers, and this time it's the walls. As I added more layers and darker, more purpley blues, I tried to keep it to the bottom and the back to help with the illusion of depth. And just a touch of out of focus dry brushing to bring out the textures. We've got two walls, so it's time to build up the back. I sketched out some more rock walls going deeper and some twisty bridges. My goal is to build up the sections like this with varying thicknesses so it's a little less boring and a little more like the ravine continues. For the paints, I'm trying something a little different that will save me some time. It won't be too visible since it's in the back wall, so it's a great place to try something new. I painted each of the layers different shades of grey so there was a gradient. Then I used the same blue to paint the whole back, relying on the different base colors to make the gradient. This is where things get a little weird, but it's definitely a trust the process moment. I'm basing the bridges in a kind of teal. It's super bright, but not for long. In a few of the screenshots, it seemed like the coral was a little lighter and maybe a little bit greener than the walls, so I wanted a different base color. Now a darker blue or teal on top. The barnacles are a darker color than the coral, so those get a wash in a much darker, more saturated blue. And it's finally time to get the barnacles their luminescence. I picked out this paint from my stash because it's white when it's not actively glowing, and it glows with a bluish tint. After carefully positioning my camera, I went right ahead and started painting with my hand completely covering what I was doing. But at least you can see the important part. The glow is working. With the help of a mug, my paint water, and a bottle of slow drying medium, I managed to get the box taped together. I had an idea for this nook, and I lined the outside with thin foam. I noticed a couple of my other nooks have a little bit of damage from where the books have bunked them, so I wanted to try this out as a protective measure. Now that the box is together, it's time to add and blend the bridges. This was surprisingly trickier than I expected, but I ended up making it work with a bit of epoxy sculpt. My nitrile gloves still haven't come in, so I'm stuck with the icky feeling latex. I completely forgot to film this part, but I did add some blue tinted paper clay to the floor so it's rocky sandy-ish, and I extended some of the weird wall veins onto the floor with paint. The nook wouldn't be complete without some really bright pops of color, so let's paint up the broken mandrakes. I based the tips of the horns in white so that the pinky orange would be more vibrant, and I painted the bodies with a dark bluey purple. In retrospect, it probably should have been more purple than that, but I'm sure it'll be fine. This camera is not doing this color justice. When they say neon, they mean, my eyes are on fire, how is this a color, neon. I ended up painting the pustules green since they seemed to glow a greenish color. I wanted to make sure it looked different than the barnacles, so I took a bit of a liberty with the color choice. 
Now for the glows. I have a great glowy green, so that's what's going on the pustules. And this pinky orange is perfect for the horn tips. And they're ready to perch on the bridges. I really liked how they turned out. Time to place the prawn suit! He took a little while to situate properly, but we did get there eventually. I wanted to try yet another new thing, and that was a lid made of clear styrene and caulk. I've seen some people do this really cool water pattern by putting caulk down, spritzing it with isopropyl alcohol, and sort of tapping it into wave shapes. It kept sticking to me the whole time, so it's definitely not exactly as I imagined. I'll have to try it again sometime. But the cool part is, if I shine my little flashlight through it and move it around, it does kind of make those watery shadows. So even if it's not pretty, it's still kind of working. My nooks have been getting pretty dusty, and it's really hard to clean them out without wrecking the little things, so I decided to put a front face on this. I found a clear sheet at Blix and used epoxy sculpt to create an edge. And with that, it's time to see the whole thing. Like always, I hope you had as much fun watching as I had with the making. Which biome would you have made? Leave me a comment, I'd love to hear! Thank you for watching this all the way through to the end, and if you like this kind of thing, please feel free to subscribe. I have so many more ideas for projects to come. If you want to watch another Subnautica project, you can check it out here, and if you want to watch more machine building, you can check out my Horizon machines here. I hope you have an amazing day, and I'll see you in the next one!